Thanks for checking out this movie review. This is for the 2001 Japanese film Ichi the Killer by Takashi Miike. I know some people who say it differently. Takashi Miike or Miike. I don't know. I say Miike. Um, been a fan of Takashi Miike for a while, actually, but this is the first of his films I'm covering. This film, you know, is it necessarily horror? I don't know. I wouldn't really call it straight up horror, but I think it gets kind of lumped into the horror category because of the brutality of it, all the kills in it, uh, the s &M aspect to it, all that type of stuff. Uh, a lot of people don't know where to throw it genre-wise. I mean, it is crime, and it is a bit thriller, but uh, it gets, gets thrown in horror all the time, and that's why it's on Shudder right now when I am doing this review, and that's where I watched it, even though I have a DVD version of it back in here somewhere. I actually own a bunch of Miike films. Uh, I'm a fan. Anyway, like I said, directed by Takashi Miike, uh, which I don't think he's ever written any of his material. He's a very prolific director. At one point, I think he was pumping out, directing um, like seven films a year for a while, which is insane. That is totally insane. So anyway, um, some of the films, he's done a ton, a ton, a ton of films. So I'm just going to name some of the films that I've seen that I would recommend seeing. Uh, Dead or Alive, I mean all three of them, but it's Diminishing Returns. Fudo, Shinjuku Triad Society, Ley Lines, The Great Yokai War, Izo, Deadly Outlaw Rekka, Sukiyaki Western Django, 13 Assassins, Imprint, Audition, and Gozu. A lot of his films are really out there, real crazy, real wacky. Uh, that's Mike. Screenplay was by Sakichi Sato, uh, who also wrote screenplays for Ichi the Killer Episode 0 and 1 Ichi. Gozu, which Mike directed. Tokyo Zombie, which I've heard good things about. A Chain of Cursed Murders. This one is interesting. Zero Man versus Half the Half Virgin. And Meatball Machine Kodoku, which I have the first Meatball Machine. I need to see more of them. That, that's fun. And it's based on a manga by Hideo Yamamoto, uh, who also did, who also has film credits for mangas, for films based off of mangas he's done, including Stop the Bitch Campaign, Stop the Bitch Campaign Again, Ichi the Killer Episode Zero, and One Ichi. It stars Ted Nobu Asano, which, by the way, he's my favorite uh, foreign actor, probably. I was going to say my favorite Japanese actor, and then I thought a little bit, I'm like, I think he's my favorite foreign actor, period. And he's definitely up there as far as, like, overall favorite actors. He's he's great. He's kind of considered, when I was reading one time, I, I was reading that he's kind of considered, like, the Johnny Depp of Japan. I don't know if that's the same now, but this was, you know, a while ago. He's been in some films like Electric Dragon, 80,000 Volts, Bright Future, uh, Last Life in the Universe, which is an amazing film. It is not horror at all. It's not action. It's a slow film, but it is an amazing film. Make sure you see that, Last Life in the Universe. The Blind Swordsman, Zatichi, Tokyo Zombie, Mongol, The Rise of Genghis Khan. Uh, a lot of people will know him from Thor and Thor Ragnarok. He's been in the Thor films. He's, he's not a huge role, but he's in there. And then, this is an interesting one. I saw it on his IMDb credits. Apparently, for the 2021 Mortal Kombat, he's going to be Raiden. I like that. I love that, actually. So, a little bit of information, on, uh, you know, little tidbits about the film. Uh, it's been banned in several countries because of the brutality and the gore. Not a big surprise there, because there are films that are less intense and less brutal and less gory that have been banned from countries. The semen in the beginning of this film that, that uh, is kind of like a puddle of semen outside of the, the apartment where uh, Ichi was masturbating while he was watching a woman get beat up and raped, um, this it, it, when it forms the title of the film, that is actual semen. I think it was one of the, the crew members provided it. Interesting. And that that's directly from Mike in one of the uh, director's commentaries. Uh, Mike wanted Yamamoto, the guy who wrote the manga for it, to write the script, but he claimed that he really wasn't able to because he had some severe writer's block, so that's why he didn't do it himself. Otherwise, he would have, which would have been interesting to see what he would have done, because I know that um, there were some differences. I'm not really going to go over all the differences, but I know there were some differences. 
Kakihara's ringtone, uh, Asano's character, uh, Kakihara in the film, who's probably the most iconic character from the film other than Ichi. And actually, he's probably just the most iconic because he's a stronger character. He's a more interesting character. He's certainly the most flashy. Uh, the way he dresses is awesome. I love his outfits, outfits in the film. But anyway, his ringtone in the film is the theme song for the film. So just a little tidbit. Uh, in the manga, actually, Ka the character of Kakihara is not good-looking at all, and he's not like a thin dude. He's like kind of a, a little bit bigger, and he's ugly. He's like a disgusting person. Uh, Yamamoto says the story is actually a love story because it, uh, this is what it said. Due to Kakihara and Ichi being the opposite on the opposite ends of the spectrum of S&M, which is sadomasochism, uh, sadism and masochism. Um, so obviously you see it and um, Ichi is obviously the sadist and Kakihara is obviously the masochist because he likes having violence and and, you know, painful things done to him. So if you watch the film knowing that, that Yamamoto, the creator, says it's ultimately a love story about these two coming together, you really see it in the film. Not like every step of the way, but you do see it. And I will kind of talk about a little bit of stuff like that. Because in the end, I mean, there is a lot of kind of like in anticipation, especially on Kakihara's part, of finally meeting Ichi. Because since um, Anjo, his, his boss wasn't around anymore he's very depressed he's very sullen and that's because Anjo used to beat him and the way he did he liked that was the part part of his masochism so since then no one's been able to come close and he feels like he's been let down a lot by that so he uh in the end obviously finds Ichi and it's kind of the ultimate experience for him from a masochistic standpoint and you feel the anticipation and see the anticipation from Kakihara throughout the film of working up and being like, ooh, he's getting closer, he's coming for me. And then even towards the end, he's saying, you know, I feel scared. But when he's saying that he's scared, he's like giddy. It's kind of like he's like excited for a first date with someone he's meeting. So watch the film and think about that stuff. It's very interesting. The crazy disorienting visuals in the very beginning of this film are crazy and disorienting. I don't really like that aspect of it, but, you know, that's kind of a thing that, Mike will do in films uh yeah uh Ichi Ichi was beating off on the balcony in the beginning because of the mix of the sex and the violence going on uh obviously you you end up learning a lot more about Ichi and his background obviously initially you think that his background uh, and where all that comes from is because he witnessed a girl being raped by bullies but then you later find out that Gigi I think his name is Gigi uh, had hypnotized him and made all of that up, and then and that really what had happened is his he had murdered his parents. So he goes through this kind of struggle throughout the film that you really end up seeing quite a bit of not really knowing who he is, being very confused about what he's feeling because he's told by Gigi and the hypnosis, uh, the ideas that have been implanted in him through hypnosis. He thinks that he's driven by revenge against bullies. That he's trying to rid the world of world of bullies because that's what his boss is telling him but in actuality and what he ends up kind of finding out at the end is that he truly is a sadist and that's in his true past of murdering his parents and just being a violent person by nature so you kind of see him have that journey as well uh, throughout the film how much would it suck to be the cleanup guy for the yakuza uh, I say that because of watching the very beginning where all those guys are kind of complaining about how they have to go in and clean up after Ichi, which every time he kills, he leaves an incredible mess. Especially because of that, all that uh, arterial spray that ends up going on, which it happens in Japanese films quite a decent amount, and it always makes me laugh. Like, I feel like it's an over-the-top thing that actually makes the violence not as intense or scary it makes it more wacky and funny and i think one of the things is one of the reasons that i don't have such a terrible like visceral reaction to a film like ichi the killer is because between the music the, the things like the arterial spray and the way that Mike shoots the film with like a lot of weird kind of off kilter angles and getting in like oddly close to characters and almost doing a little bit of like an evil dead type angle thing um, at times. I think those things keep 
it feeling just weird and odd and wacky instead of intense and scary and disgusting. So it's weird. It, 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 it's this weird kind of dichotomy of like this terrible, intense, gory stuff going on right here. But the feel of it is very different. Uh, it's way lighter, which is super odd. Uh, which actually, when you think about it, would make sense because someone who's into S&M would kind of view it that way as not being at, as, you know, scary or intense. They would view it as being more, you know, kind of light and, you know, interesting. The first look at Kakihara is interesting. I assume that the scars that he has on himself are probably self-inflicted, maybe done by someone else. I say probably self-inflicted just because of what happens later with this whole tongue-cutting situation, which I'll talk about that a little bit. As an audience member, you feel like you need to play catch-up somehow because you're just plopped in the middle of Yakuza dealings with basically no context. But then again, you know, this is something that Mike does a decent amount with his films, especially when they're Yakuza-related films, which he's done a decent amount of Yakuza-related films. It's just something he likes to go for. Um, and it's interesting because it literally is like you're just dropped in the middle of stuff going on because literally you're dropped in the middle of drama between a bunch of kind of Yakuza clans, basically, in this film. And then it takes you a little bit to catch up and you're just like, oh, okay, now I understand what's going on here. The first torture scene of the guy suspended uh, and the use of the shrimp tempura hot oil uh, on the back is certainly a way to kind of set the tone as far as the brutality and violence. I think it's probably the most intense and messed up of all the scenes, in my opinion, or at least for me personally, um, especially when you end up seeing how much joy it's bringing Kakihara in the film. Like, you see in that, in that scene how much inflicting pain really makes him happy but then later on in the film you see how it's having pain inflicted on him makes him even more happy so Ichi seeing the girl at the club is the next step of seeing who he is as a person it's kind of these layers that keep getting pulled back of Ichi throughout the film uh he needs to relive seeing her being beaten and that, that's the woman he goes to see at the club after he had been outside of her balcony watching her being beaten and raped. And then he shows up and he he likes seeing the aftermath and remembering what he was seeing and then having her talk about it. That's his fetish. You know, that gets him off. It then goes to the scene of Kakihara cutting his tongue. So after the scene of, of Ichi reaching, uh, you know, going and seeing this woman, it, it's this intense thing of pleasure for him at that point. That's kind of like his height of pleasure at the moment. And then it goes right after that to the scene of Kakihara cutting his tongue off, which is uh, a parallel of Ichi's scene with the girl, basically, of Kakihara's height of um, pleasure at that point as he cuts his own tongue off. And, and you can sense it, you can tell it. Um, so I thought it was cool that they kind of did that. Mike has a bunch of odd and eccentric characters in his films. That's another thing that happens a lot. Prime example, the guys with the clear masks and the, all that, like, gachapon, those little, you know, like, figures all over their, you know, beanies. Uh, also, you know, the whole thing with the, the brothers later on that, you know, the one puts, like, the little animal ears on and says he's going to be, like, this, this special, you know, animal detective. It's weird. Uh, but that, you know, that's Mike. That's what he does with these films. He has, he has these weird, quirky characters. And that's part of what keeps films like this less tense, less scary, less gory. Well, I mean, they're still gory, but just you feel it less. The cut in half scene is crazy, but kind of looks funny uh, now because the CGI is bad. And that's one of the things with this film. I say all the time, I hate when films have used CGI, especially when they age, because it never looks good over time. So that's one of the things I don't like about Ichi the Killer watching it now is that the CGI a lot of times doesn't look so hot. You can tell it's not actually there. It's kind of like pasted on in the, in the cut in half scene, even though it is kind of cool and impressive, just isn't looking so solid anymore. I uh, already talked about the arterial spray. Can't tell you how much fun I think that is in film. Um, it's funny how afraid everyone is of Kakihara all the time, especially in those moments where he acts very docile. I love that. You know, obviously he's, he's a big wig. He's a big name. He's Everyone's afraid of him, especially because he doesn't mind taking punishment from others. Like, he actually kind of welcomes it. So, 
you know, how are you not going to be afraid of a person who loves to dole out pain and punishment and doesn't care about having it, you know, enacted back to him? Ichi does seem confused. Yes. Okay. So we already talked about that. I'll skip that. That's about him being confused initially, but figuring out who he is eventually. Kakihara is convinced that Ichi is coming for him, but he has no clue what an unfocused mess Ichi actually is. That's one of the interesting things about Kakihara's perception of Ichi throughout this entire film is that he think, thinks he's like this sadistic mastermind who's got everything planned and he's just slowly coming after Kakihara. And Kakihara almost kind of views it as it's like this intentional buildup that he's getting that like he's trying to make him scared. He's trying to build it up for them. Uh, but he's not, you know, it's just that Ichi can't figure out who he is. It's this giant mess. And he's just being told by Gigi, you know, where he has to go and what he has to do. And he's just kind of fumbling through things. So to see those two sides of it are interesting. The scene of Kakihara catching the guy's fist in his mouth and then stripping all the skin off as he pulls it out is a pretty crazy one. And uh, it, it, it looks nuts. I think it's cool. It is relatively intense. I do like that scene quite a bit. The woman pre pretending to be, be the girl who was raped becomes the catalyst for Ichi finally figuring out who he actually is and what he actually wants to be doing, um, although he does seem to kind of fall apart in the end once again, uh, but at least for a little bit. He's, he's hyper-focused. He's like, I know what to do, and I know what I need to be doing here, but I, I can't really... My thought, and I might be wrong, I don't know, tell me in the comments, I think maybe she was doing that as kind of like a um, favor to her boss, to kind of awaken Ichi because he had been saying that he was having, you know, focusing issues. He couldn't, you know, he, I think he was saying he could get hard, but he couldn't come basically. Um, so I think she was trying to like get him going and get him like back on track as far as like, you know, being ready to, to go for the boss to go, you know, make the kills. But other than that, I couldn't figure out why she got in that situation because obviously it was very dangerous and ended up being deadly for her. It was nuts. When Kakihara is talking about being scar uh, scared of, to meet Ichi, he's giddy like he's nervous for the first date. I know I already said this, but it's very important at that part of the film because it feels very mismatched for what's coming and for, and for what Kakihara should be feeling unless you're viewing it from the standpoint of what I was talking about, about this kind of love, you know, love story of the relationship coming together. I dig the way they did the slow motion uh, for the chase scene on the rooftop. Uh, that actually may be my favorite sequence of, of the film visually because it looks so cool. Like, you can see, especially in the expressions of Kakihara as he's kind of, like, you know, maneuvering. Like, he's going to do his best to stay alive and to fight because that's part of the sport. But he's, he's like, scared and excited at the same time. And I think the, the slow motion aspect of that rooftop scene really captures things really well. I love it. The ex-cop walking towards his son while he's bleeding after he's had his throat cut. It's kind of a ridiculous scene because he's like still moving even though he's lost who knows how much blood. But it, it also just becomes funny because it drags on that long. And it's all that like crazy arterial spray. Although it's not going out, it's like going down. But it's just ridiculous. Um, let's be honest, the film is too long. And it is actually pretty slow at times. But that's another thing. It's kind of like this cultural thing. A lot of Japanese films are on the slower side. They take their time. Actually, a lot of non-American films are kind of that way. So, so it becomes this issue where I know there are people who won't watch uh, horror. You know, I was gonna say I was gonna say horror. It's not just horror. Won't watch foreign films in general, not just because of subtitles, but because the films are slower. We over the past bunch of decades have gotten to a point where they try and keep things you know shorter and more tight film wise really moving action packed and a lot of other you know countries aren't really doing that because they're trying to leisurely tell a story kind of take everything in look around at you know soak in the environment and Ichi the killer is like that uh, although I would argue it probably needs to be cut down a little bit because it's a bit over two hours and I don't think there's really two hours worth of content there in my opinion uh, all right Mike, Mike is big on free roaming camera work for this film. Uh, it's always moving and it has lots of shots going down the streets, sometimes in like normal times, sometimes kind of sped up. But then also like doing these long scenes of following people places, like through hallways, into rooms, up the stairs, and stuff like that. 
I like it because it feels almost a little bit like you're actually there, like almost a little found footage-esque, but not quite crossing that boundary. So I like the way that plays. It makes things feel a little more real. Mike uses a lot of odd angles and has goofy characters with comedic moments. These things help soften the mood of the brutality. I know I already said this, but it definitely bears repeating. That is a very important thing about why a lot of people can watch this film and not really have a big problem with it. Uh, and I remember the first time I watched it, which I'll tell you in a minute. For Ichi, this is a pretty extreme example of doing what you love for a living. Think about that. Because truly, it is what he loves. And he was getting paid. I assume he was getting paid. I mean, they were jobs. He was getting these envelopes of people he needed to kill. Uh, or maybe he was just surely doing it for the revenge that he thought he was getting when he wasn't actually getting any. Um, so good ending to this film, good film overall. Uh, the first time I ever saw this, I'll tell you, uh, I had a friend who would watch all sorts of crazy stuff. He gave the DVD to me and was like, look, I want you to watch this film. It's insane. It's definitely worth seeing. Uh, don't watch it when anyone's around, watch it at night before you go to bed. Because if somebody walks in when you're watching this film, they're going to judge you. <laughs> Uh, and I'm glad I took that advice. I watched it late at night before I went to bed and I was just like, wow, yeah, I'm glad I did this on my own. Um, and then I felt like if I can watch this film, I can watch any violent film pretty much. I can see anything in a film because especially back when I saw it, which was probably around, I don't know, 2005 ish. I was like, oh my gosh, you know, um, that's very intense that my senses were, just like overwhelmed. I had not experienced gore and brutality like that in a film before. Obviously, I've seen a lot worse since. But um, yeah, I mean, it was crazy at the time. And some people would still say it is. So anyway, out of five stars with half stars possible, uh, I would give Ichi the Killer a pretty solid three and a half star rating. I, I'm not willing to go to a quite like a four star level. I think it is a good film. I don't think it's a great film. Um for reasons that I kind of laid out. I was between three and a half and four, but I think three and a half is kind of where it should be. It is, I recommend it if you haven't seen it, but no, it's extremely brutal. But anyway, uh, put your comments down here. I'd love to hear what you think about it. Do you love it? Do you hate it? Have you, do you not want to ever watch it because, you know, it's too much for you? I don't know. But do me a quick favor and hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. That's your way to repay me if you like any video I've ever done, including this one, because I'm not getting paid or anything. And it literally takes you a second. It is totally painless for you to go ahead and do that for me. I would really appreciate it. Also, hit the notification bell when you do that. If you've already done it, hit the notif or if you're already subscribed, hit the notification bell now. If you're going to subscribe, also hit the notification bell now. That way you know when I'm putting up you know, movie reviews or unboxings or doing live streams or any of that great stuff. But... Regardless, I really do appreciate you taking this time to check out this video, and until next time, keep it brutal.